Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hayyakum Allah jami'an. Welcome back to our Minhaj sessions. And today's esteemed guest, my beloved to the heart, is my beloved Abu Safiya Al Maliki, Hafidullah Ta'ala. We have a lot of history together. Uh, walhamdulillah, by the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we were able to do a lot of talabat uh, al-ilm together uh, with various mashayikh ahl sunnah So without getting too much sidetracked, let's get right into the session. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hayyakum Allah. Hayyakum Allah. Hayyakum Allah. So... Let, let's just get right into it and, 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 and try and la'alana nastafid and in hopes that we benefit and, and that others can benefit from this, uh, this sitting. So one of the issues we find is we find uh, with regards to the dawah out there that there is a lot of uh, effect from uh, various dawah organizations and jama'at. So I wanted to ask you, uh, what is problematic with the group uh, Akhwana Muslimin? And also, what trends do you see within that movement? Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah, wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa ba'd. First of all, I'd like to thank you, Akhi Aziz Khalid, for inviting me onto your program and your husna dhanbiya in that you feel that I can deal with some of these topics. Now, I don't want to be protracted and go too long, but the Khwani Muslimin is an organization that was founded in the 19th century. This organization, to really be brief about its history, was founded by a, a man by the name of Hassan al-Banna, rahimullah. Hmm. When Hassan al-Banna founded the Khwani Muslimin, initially the Khwani Muslimin was a dawah organization. He would go to the bars, to the cafeterias, to the places of repute and ill repute and calling people to Islam, calling them out of the bars, the cafeterias, calling them to the masajid. However, one of the things of Hassan al-Banna is he beca became frustrated. As we learn from a kit a Kitab Asul al the book Asul al one of the important principles is a sabaru ala adafihi that is the person has is patient forbearance perseverance because of adversity due to calling to the dawah now hasan banna found that because of political reasons his dawah was stymied or he found obstacles now here is a very important point about his dawah mm. the dawah of hasan banna is not based upon the same dawah of the Anbiya and the Rusul. The dawah of the Anbiya and the Rusul is to call to Tawheed. We have many places in the Quran that alludes to this. No. All the messengers, all the prophets, whoever we say our beloved Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to Nuh no. every single one of them called to Tawheed. That is the singling out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his worship in his lordship and his names and attributes. The dawah of Hassan al-Banna wasn't based upon this. Hassan al-Banna's dawah was to collect the people, as long as you call yourself Muslim, whatever you believe, whatever you think, whatever you feel, come together. Now, some people may question, they may say, wait, brother, what's wrong with this? Hmm. Our Sheikh Muhammad al-Man al-Jami, rahimullah ta'ala, he made a fantastic, parable of similitude about this call. It is like a man who calls the people to prayer. Mm. The person with wudu, the person without wudu, the, per the woman who is uh, pure, the woman who is impure. It doesn't matter your state or your condition. Just come to pray. We can see from this parable it's problematic no. because this act of worship, this great act of worship, which is salah, it's only acceptable if it meets its conditions. The same with dawah. Dawah is acceptable if it meets its condition. One of the conditions of dawah, besides the person having knowledge, a knowledge of whom they're calling to and what they're calling to, is to call to Tawheed in the correct Akidah. As we learned from 
uh, our Sheikh Muhammad al Banna, who was present in a meeting between Hamad al Faqhi. Ahmad al Faqhi was an Egyptian scholar no. who set up an organization called Ansar al Sunnah Muhammadiyah, which mm -hmm. is still in existence today in Egypt. Okay. And this organization calls the Tawheed and the correct Aqidah. Mm. They, were, they began before the Khwani Muslimin. So there was a meeting between Hamla Faqih and Hassan Banna where it was called to see how can they work together? Mm. What are the parameters they can lay down to work together? Now, what was the answer of Hassan Banna to Hamla Faqih? Hamla Faqih was a person who was based upon, he based his religion upon philosophy and the people of Kalam and he left that and he came to the pure way of the pious predecessors. Hassan Banna's response to him Unity in our shirk is better than disunity in your tawheed. Wa Do you see that? Yes. So unity, if you are Rafadi, who cursed the Sahaba, if you are somebody who is Khariji, believes in killing the people, whatever, doesn't matter. Mm. All of us come together. Now, this is the first problem of the Dawah of Hassan al-Banna. Yeah. Now, fast forward to 2020, we find many people today are ba based their dawah on, upon calling the Muslims to unity mm. while leaving the prerequisite for unity, which is the correct creed. Allah Many people, while they don't vocalize it, they don't say it, mm. however, they believe that telling the people to co come to the correct creed, if you go to Masjid, a thousand people praying there, and you ask them, what is Tawheed? I am sure you'll get 500 different definitions of Tawheed. SubhanAllah. Like what is la ilaha illallah? Some people say there's no God but Allah, but Allah tells us in the Quran there's other aliha that people worship. Mm. If you say to people, okay, what is tawheed al ibadah? Some people will say correct tawheed al ibadah, which is to single out worship to Allah only. Some people will say, well, part of worship is to ask the person, the inmate of the grave, to ask Allah on your behalf your needs, which is shit. No. no. If you ask people about Allah's names and attributes, what will they say? Mm. They will say, well, I believe in seven, I don't believe in the rest. I believe in five, I don't believe in the rest. I don't believe in any names, but I believe in all the attributes. Don't believe in any attributes, but I believe in the names. Don't believe in no names, no attributes. This is what you will have. Wallah this is a big nasiba. And this yeah. is why we can't have unity. We don't have unity because we believe in different things. How can you come together when you believe in different things? No. If you believe that the window, if you imagine in a house, a husband and a wife, the wife believes all the windows should be on the north side. The husband says, no, all the windows on the south side. How can you come together? It's impossible. Mm. How, what base of unity is there? Mm. Oh, my religious brother in Islam. So we find many of the du'at, they leave aside, according to Tawheed, the correct aqidah, which is the role of the messengers in the Anbiya, and they focus on uniting irrespective of what we believe. And that's why we find, unfortunately, there's no barakah much of what we do. Because mm. we're not called to what Allah's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, called to, which is Tawheed. What he called to in Makkah, what he called to in Medina, what he taught his Sahaba, called to Tawheed. And this is a big problem. I hope that answers your question. Naam, naam. Jazakallah khairan. So then, how, how do you find, uh, I, I, you, you pretty much clarified that, but how do you find that affects uh, contemporary ex salafis because you know you we see a lot of people kind of leaving uh the pristine call to the book in the sunnah and they seem to be tainted with these principles although they're not card carrying members what you know how do you see that uh you know do you see that there's an, an effect there because a lot of people they negate that and so what you find with the current contemporary do art especially those who have quote unquote left salafia is yeah. this you find some of them flip flop? Flip flop. Mm. One minute they have Salafi creed, the next minute they are affirming or keeping quiet about that which goes against it. So mm. they believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above the seven heavens and seven earths. This is mm. the Salafi creed. Next minute they affirm or they keep quiet when somebody says Allah is everywhere and we seek refuge in Allah, which is uh, uh, ancient, uh, ancient uh, Greek belief, uh, not an Islamic belief. You also find them belittling the teaching of the correct Aqidah, the correct Tawheed. So the mm. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi came with the correct creed, he came with the correct Tawheed. They say, no, 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 no. You can, for example, Tashari Aqidah. 
The Ash'ari Aqidah is Aqidah which was founded 300 years after the coming of the Prophet ﷺ. Not one of the Sahaba, all the successors, all the successors, su succeeding successors were Ash'ari or Maturidi or Rafidi or Jafari or Ismaili. None of them were on these creeds. All these creeds came well after them and you can pinpoint the juncture they came into Islamic history. So Ash'ari creed, in the time of the Prophet, who was Ash'ari? Hmm. There was no one called as Ashari, why it was Abu Musa al Ashari, no. radiallahu anhu. Did he have a creed different than the Prophet? No, hmm. at the same to the Prophet, it's the creed of Salaf. <clears throat> Go on 300 years, then you find a particular juncture where a man, when he grew up, remember Abu Hassan al Ashari has three stages. No. First of all, he was on Murtazili creed of Ibn Kulab, hmm. sorry, Murtazili creed. Then he went into his own creed, and then he came back to the creed of Ahl al-Sunnah wal Jamaa, as found in his book al -Ibana. No. So you even have the Imam they ascribe the Aqid to. He left their creed. Mm. He left what they were upon. No. But you're still saying teach it. So what you find is, while knowing better and have been taught better, they say no. It's you can teach other creeds, and some of these other creeds are philosophy. They've been highly influenced by Greek philosophy. And here's an important side point, my brother. No. Greek philosophy isn't like we see today secularized. Mm. You go to a university or college to learn philosophy, they take religion out of it. But if you are to read Plato, for example, the Republic, you find he has a religious belief. It's not that he doesn't have a belief, he has a religious belief, and this comes into the philosophy. This underpins that philosophy. And so when you say people, well, you can teach this particular creed or another creed outside the creed of Salaf, you're saying, well, hey, you can teach a creed which is which is which is which has highly borrowed from philosophy, no. Greek philosophy, and that religion. It doesn't matter, and this is a very big problem. All mm. you find, on the other hand, they just keep quiet. They don't call the people to tawhid. They don't mention things of aqidah. They don't no. mention things of 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 creed. They they just only narrow down on the sins. Mm. And it's important to talk about sins. It's important to talk about social issues. Of course. But social issues are after according to, according to the right creed. No. They are secondary. Mm. Are you with me, brother? No, They're no, secondary. no. Not yes. the primacy of our dawah. Our dawah is not just about warning against zina, warning against luat, warning against music, warning yeah. against free mixing. That's all important and a very important part of our dawah. But yeah. it doesn't take precedence over calling to tawheed and calling to the right creed. And that's what you find with these with these uh, brothers who unfortunately they've left the way of the Salaf or mm. they dibble dabble one minute in it and one minute out that they just belittle the creed. Sometimes if you say after knowing the correct, correct creed well you can teach Ash'ariya or Maturudiya, it's like you're belittling the creed of Salaf as it has no value to you. Just check, just like choose, come, choose one. <laughs> you know, like I come to you and I say, brother Khadi, can I help you? And you turn around and say, well hey, I don't need your help. Belittling you, isn't it? Mm. So you say, well, just choose whichever you want to. It doesn't matter. Mm. If they have, are you saying to me, these creeds which come after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have more bearing, more value, and more weight than the creed of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? No. More bearing, value, than weight than the creed of the Sahaba? Is that what you're Allah saying? Well, you can choose whatever you want to believe. Mm. Subhanallah. Even Christians don't believe that. Mm. Seventh-day Adventists, you're upon what they're upon. You can't go become Catholic. Yeah. If you become Catholic, you're a heretic. No. A Catholic church. You can't turn around to tomorrow and say, well, hey, I'm going to be Church of God of Prophecy, or I'm going to become evangelical, I'm going to be Anglican. That's heresy to them. Mm. No. You can't say to a Jewish a Jewish uh, family, well, I'm going to become, you know, uh, some kind of Christian kind of Jew. They'll pray, they pray a prayer that you have died and passed away. It's heresy. Mm. So how come as Muslims, after knowing the correct creed, the mm. sources of that creed, turn around and say, well, hey, you can choose which other creed you want to. No. So now the person, if, if we take this to its extreme, you can then take the creed of the Rafida who believe that the Quran is Naqis. That mm. is, the Quran that we have today is not the Quran that the Prophet ﷺ had. They believe in their Imams, their 12 Imams, that these 12 Imams have the power and the ability of the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they also believe that Ali is yeah, a deity to be worshipped. Yeah. So when <clears throat> Ali radiallahu anhu dig the pit <throat> and threw them in and burned them, they said, Anta Hua. He said, mm. Who am I? He said, they said, You are him. He said, Who am I? 
They said, you are Allah because only Allah can burn you in fire. So that's okay to teach. Mm. Is, this, is, this, is this Islam? No. <laughs> so this is the danger of some of those du'at. Because mm. unfortunately, my respected brother, what mm. we find that those people in France, the Khani Muslimin, they have a number of principles. And today what we find with them, the principle is to make people happy in order for them to like us so mm. if you look a good example is democracy mm. if you went 20 years ago 15 years ago to khani muslimin about democracy what would they say kufr mm. to mm. adjudicate other than what allah has revealed that's what they would say about democracy they no. would declare you to be apostate no. now today all of them are in one tune one hymn sheet tapping the same tabla democracy mm. why mm. did i say democracy because they want, they realize the only way for them to get power is through democracy. Mm. They don't have an army to become in power. So they call for democracy as we find in Egypt. Yes. No. And say other things like music. One of them, he said, music is haram. The only type of music that is halal. Mm. And I've had debates with people about this recently is classical music. No, so there's some classical point. music, which are, which are in dedication to Freemasonry. That's okay. Subhanallah. <laughs> <laughs> Classical music is okay. What standard do you use to judge that something is halal or haram? What, you need a text to go back to, a reference point. And mm. if there isn't any reference point to go to, then everybody can make their own intellect the reference point. So I like rap music. He mm. likes Lil Wayne. I like Run DMC. This one mm. likes uh, this one likes LL Cool J. This one over here doesn't like uh, rap music, but like soul music. Tony Braxton. Mm. Where do you stop? Where do you stop? When you open mm. these doors? No. And why do they do these things? They're not because Sharia and they need to do them, but because they want to make it facilitate ease and people like them. And that's mm. what we see with the same, the same duat in the West. And so one of them, he said, look, the theory of evolution, which is still a theory, because you can't prove it. Mm. I don't want to go, go, go rehearse it over here. Yeah. You can't prove it. Yeah. No, they have, do not have this definitive proof as to how life began. Mm. It is a theory. One of them, they said, how ah, life began through a smudge sludge and what happened a lightning bolt hit the sludge and life started That's they correct. tried to replicate this exact this uh, experiment and every time they did they failed so mm. much so that the the mm. evolutionists today they give up on the question how did life begin mm. My point here is one of them he said in terms of human beings no we come from adam and eve mm. but in terms of uh in terms of animals yes evolution so they started from uh, from what it is an amoeba and became what they are today look at this mm. what was his justification put that aside what was his justification for accepting the theory of evolution mm. the justification my respected brother is he said quoting you look silly to western people when you you deny the theory of evolution mm. well, I, how, 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 how. subhanallah so, subhanallah you Press Western European people That's who deep. themselves don't have an agreement to this. No, yeah, yeah. Even some scientists are saying the theory of evolution is not best fit for our understanding of life. Subhanallah. And they're atheists themselves. So just to impress the West or to make them not look down upon you, ah, accept the theory of evolution. And this is what happens when you have these type of people influenced by the Khwani Muslimin. Wallahu alam. Subhanallah. Well, you, that brings up a very important, so, so then I guess we can say, a very important point, that the Dawabit, you know, the criterion for a lot of these uh, du'at and a lot of these groups is really the pleasure of the people. You know, it, it's a kethra thing, you know, we can see a lot of the entertainment da'wah, we can see this. Dawabit, which means guiding principles, they have yeah. none. Yeah. Dawabit, like Kawa'id principles, are all based upon nas. Allah. No. Yeah. No. So, for example, we say uh, intentions. Uh, uh, the affairs are by the intention. That's based upon the hadith. Indeed, actions are contingent upon intention. No. One of the first two hadith, of forty hadith, and Nawi. Yes. No. There's nas. Many of their so-called guiding principles, dua bi are not existent either. They are falsely attributed to hadith mm. and ayat out of context not understood that way by the Salaf, no. or there are ayat, sorry, there are hadith which are fabricated, or 
they are intellectual understandings of these hadith or just from their own intellect. Mm. They have no duabit. And they make people happy, not because they want people just to be happy, but they want people to like them, to follow them. And in those countries where they are, mm. where there are elections to elect them, so they come into power. Please like and subscribe. <laughs> yeah. And so you find, for example, Hamas, yeah. everybody believes Hamas is a religious organization. Hmm. But Hamas, they themselves said before they were elected into power, that when we get into power, we are not going to implement Sharia or force people to follow Sharia. Look at that. Hmm. Hmm. You have a number of them stating that. No. So this is what they're about. They're about getting into that, that chair, the courtesy, and so they're in positions of authority. Hmm. Jazakallah khairan. So in light of all of this, what is the way forward uh, with the dawah, with the dawah in general? Because we see there's a lot of different groups, there's a lot of different influences, there's a lot of different Islamic influencers or whatever they call them, uh, a lot of false principles. But one thing we see, we see a, a lot of hatred, a growing hatred, although we see the dawah kind of growing on one end, uh, and another way we also see there's a growing hatred and vocalization of that hatred and animosity towards Salafis for the actions of many, many of our du'at especially, but you know, we can find this in many countries, but I think in the West more so that we've seen a lot of uh, du'at who've come back and destroyed communities, they've destroyed people's integrity, they didn't have the proper adab and manners, nor the fiqh fideen. So with uh, this being the case, this uh, has caused a lot of uh, anti, you know, I'm talking to brothers daily on the ground who listen to me, who we have a lot of history, but they say, you know, I like some of the things the Salafis, but I also kind of like what the Sufis are saying here. And I like the Ashidis kind of say this. And, you know, I kind of, you know, so I, you know, work with them and, you know, we, you know, alhamdulillah, they respect me, but, but, you know, we've seen a lot of damage done. What's the way forward? In your Before view. I talk about the way forward, I want to make a small point. Yeah. Now, without a doubt, there are some brothers who, because of what they say and what they do, can have a negative reaction to the general Muslim community. However, no. all of us, we have to be honest and sincere and not disingenuous. Why mm. do I say that? No. When one Muslim brother straps bombs to himself, goes to Times Square, and tries to kill people, we all turn around and say, he doesn't represent Islam. No. He, he's representing his own opinion. No. Even if a thousand people did that, we would never say, I went to a, a conference some years ago, mm. and I'll cut a long story short. Uh, this person made a presentation, it was a Christian conference. Mm. They made a presentation about Muslims in Nigeria and how Muslims are killing non-Muslims. Mm. Horrific, horrific presentation. Mm. People being burned, people being uh, macheted, all that kind of stuff. Mm. So I said to the gentleman, I said, that is absolutely horrific and has nothing to do with Islam. Mm. But I have a question to ask you. The Muslims who are extreme, are you saying there's a million Muslims who are extreme? He said, no, 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 I'm not saying that. And we whittle it all down to a handful, 20, 30, 40 Muslims. Mm. The reality on the ground is the same way we absolve and say we are free from those people who do acts of terrorism, they don't represent us. Those people who may be Salafi or maybe not be Salafi, but in wolves in sheep clothing that do things that contradict the way of the Salaf, no. we can't be blamed for what they do. And people, no. you know, if a Sufi did something, well, they have a thousand excuses. When a Salafi does it, all of a sudden Salafi is bad. No. You get me? Even mm. if a thousand of us do it, we... We are not the reference point, and this is something people forget. We no. are not the reference point. The reference point is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the first three generations of Islam. That's the reference no. point. No. Not a specific yeah, country, not no. a specific alim, not a specific, specific geopolitical location, not a specific masjid, not a specific jama'ah. They're not the reference point. Mm. The reference point is the kitab and the sunnah. So no. why are we blaming the kitab and the sunnah as understood by the first three generation? for the actions of us who are ignorant, who are born in the West, don't know the Arabic language, trying to find our way, trying to come back to a real type of Islam, and sometimes we mess up. Mm. And for argument's sake, all the time we mess up. Don't look to us, we are not the example. 
Yeah. I would say to that person, go back to the Quran and the Sunnah as it's understood by the first three generation of Islam. And mm. so it goes back to your point. I listened to the, 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 the lecture that you posted, the first Manhaj session mm. with our brother, the Stad Abdullah Luxembourg, Bergi, no. Hafidhullah. Yeah. I think that's how you say his name. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And him, that, that's a question you post to him. Hmm. That's a fantastic, how do we ascertain the truth? Hmm. Brothers and sisters, the truth, irrespective of who, what, where, when and why, is the Quran, the Sunnah, and the, this, these two sources of legislation, of theology, these two sources understood by the first three generations of Islam. Yeah. As Allah tells in the Quran, if you believe the way they believed, then you would be guided. Who is it they? Hmm. Me and you? Hmm. Of course not. No. It is the Sahaba. So no. if you understand these two sources, the way they understood it, as we can see, how did Islam spread? Through their actions. We are hmm. standing on the shoulders of the Sahaba. No. Whether it be for theology, whether it be the blessing of Islam, we're standing on their shoulders. And so I would say to anybody, when anyone opens their mouth and they say to you anything about Islam, the first thing you ask them, what is your proof? Mm. What is the delil? No. They must tell you verse from the Quran or hadith or a hadith of the Prophet wasallam. Then you ask them, did the Sahaba understand that ayah the way you understand it? Mm. Did the Sahaba understand that hadith the way you understand it? And ask them to give you the source. Okay, what book can I find this brother? What book can I find that sister? They mm. give you the source or send you the source and you sit with somebody and you find that source because mashallah to barakallah, there's a vast library of Islamic books out there. What you want, you'll find. Mm. Go to Maktaba al shamila you'll mm. find it. That's right. So get somebody to help you find the book, find the source, and then you say, okay, maybe I can accept this. But mm. this is a starting point. How do you know you're upon the truth? No. You know you're upon the truth where you're upon that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to you. Mm. And follow that which has been revealed to you. Mm. And do not take other than it as guardians. Mm. When you're following the Quran, and when you're following the Sunnah, whatever Allah, Allah says, whatever the Prophet gives you, take it. And whether he prohibits you from, leave it. Mm. When you find yourself in the Quran, the Sunnah understood by the first three generations, Alhamdulillah, you're upon felicity. And that's how the Salaf was solid. The pious predecessor saw it. When they are upon the way of the Salaf, the way, the way the Salaf means, Quran and Sunnah is understood by the first few generations. When you're upon that, you're upon felicity. Everything else is the suppositions, the conclusions of men that may concur with the truth or may go against the truth. Mm. Wallahu alam. And our venerable Imam, Imam Malik, rahmatullah, said that the succeeding generations will not be successful until they are upon that which the previous generations were upon. Mm. The previous generations, the Sahaba were upon the Kitab and the Sunnah. No. And an understanding which they took from the Prophet Sallallahu oh, Our success in the future from today and the billion years into the future is by following the Kitab and the Sunnah. That's the only way for us to succeed. And we can look at where we fell when we started following philosophy and the opinions of men. We mm. see our demise, Wallahu Alam. Mm. Allah Yubarak Feek. Jazakallah Khairan. This is a little, I'm shifting a little bit and hopefully not taking up too much of your time. Uh, go for it. No, go for it, bro. So uh, in light of the current events, you know, the call for Black Lives Matter, you know, this new trend, which has really become a, a trend. And what's interesting, of course, here in America, most of the people who have uh, behind that trend, of course, uh, generally are, are, are Caucasian people. For example, whites in America are the ones in a lot of the protests I'm seeing, especially here, you know, that you don't even see any black people in the crowd, <laughs> but that's another story. So in light of these current uh, events and this trend, we see that some Muslims are involved, uh, you know, this gives, this opens the door for them to be involved in secular movements and secular things. We've seen this with the, uh, the sister who's Palestinian in America, I forgot her name, Lisa, uh, not Lisa, but uh, I forgot her name anyhow. Linda Soro. Yes, Linda. And, and others who are, you know, pro LGBTQT and everything else in between and, and, and what have you. So we see this, this trend of, of, of getting involved with secular movements under the guise of forbidding oppression or combating racism. 
from your studies, do you think uh, we should support such movements? Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa ba'd. First of all, I'm not giving a fatwa, but my observation. No. I'm not qualified to give fatwa, but my observation. Allah tells us to cooperate upon righteousness and piety and do not cooperate upon sin and enmity. Mm. So we will cooperate, for example, with a group or a, sec a group that is not religious based or an individual, but it's upon righteousness and piety. No. We're not going to then put aside our Islamic values or what we hold to be Islamic and important just because of this particular unity. Mm. If that is the case, that we have to, then like Malcolm X, for example, mm. we will then have our own organizations and we call from our own platform. Mm. Are you with me? General yeah. answer there. We don't unify with people who may call to sin and disbelief, for no. example. Mm. We don't unify with some people, and I'm being extremely general, to there where the platform is accepting constructions of marriage, for example, that are not founded in Kitab and the Sunnah. Mm. We have to be very careful. Kind However, yeah. being black, and Malcolm X said this all the time, you don't get arrested because you're American. Mm. The reason why you're arrested is because you're black. And we recognize as being black reverts that racism is real. Yeah. Not only real in the non-Muslim world, in the Muslim world. Mm. It's real. And this racism is against Islam. It is something that we should fight. No. Especially when racism and white supremacy is an existential threat to us. It can affect, look at, if you saw recently uh, George Floyd's video, every single one of us who are black, we can put ourselves in his shoes. Mm. It mm. could have been any one of us. No. And I can appreciate our Arab brothers and Pakistani brothers and non-black brothers, they may not feel that. Mm. Because maybe that is not the experience. But George Floyd, if you've seen the recent video, he's be begging, mm. almost like a child, begging the police officer, please don't kill me. Please mm. don't shoot me. Yeah. In the end, the police officer killed him. No. That could have been me. That could be you. Because we fit that profile. They don't fit yeah. that profile. So yeah. you can't say to me, well, hey, don't try to fight against racism, even though it's an existential threat. So let it kill me and kill my children. Mm. I don't think that Islamically makes sense. Yeah. But again, being very general, we need to be careful upon what but we have to be clear if we unite with individuals or groups, what we are uniting upon. Because some people almost a blanket un unity, blanket unity. No, we may work together. For example, we may be uh, community organizations. And so we may work with another organization, for example, to hold an event that brings to light police brutality, for example. Mm -hmm. We may work with an individual such as a, a member of Congress, a member of Parliament, a senator, to get, to get uh, training to make sure part of his policy is training for the police in respect to anti-black racism. Mm. And I personally expect many non-black Muslims not to understand why we may want to do this because they, first of all, don't experience anti-black racism. And anti-black racism is endemic in the Muslim community anyhow. Mm, you know, that. Muslims, yeah. for example, for Muslim, for example, when you go to, if it's a white brother and a black brother, when it comes to marriage, you know the white brother is going to get it over the black brother and the black brother has to be Dr. Dre dripping in money yeah. for him to get it looking. Yeah. <laughs> Even when it comes to dawah. You have brothers like yourself who are very talented and qualified, mashallah. You have a PhD in Islamic studies. We have mm -hmm. brothers who have no qualification in Islam, who are lackluster like everybody else, but they're the ones who are getting the opportunities. White mm. privilege. Mm. You hear me? And this is just the tip of the iceberg of white privilege. Mm. And the people don't understand where we're coming from. And also, because it's endemic, they can't see what the problem is. You grow up calling, for example, the Urdu word for black is Kala, but mm. also is the connotation of the N-word. Mm. So you grow up calling black people Kala, monkeys, all kind of stuff like that. Yeah, you don't perceive why it's important to address that, mm. isn't it? Mm. You don't understand why to address it. So I can understand why. So this is my observation and Allah mm. knows best. Mm. <laughs> so uh, stemming from that, and this will be the last, uh, the last question or last issue. 
So then what we see in a reaction to some of these things, we see some brothers and sisters, you know, perhaps due to a lack of fic or what have you, uh, in the, in the Dean, they believe we should support or cooperate, cooperate with nationalist movements. Uh, for example, the nation of Islam, or we should, uh, we should support them. And that nationalism is actually acceptable because you find that in many Muslim countries, if not all Muslim countries, you find that you find the, the movement, you know, this is just part of the nation state. It's a part of the development. Perhaps there were some Masadi and some aspects of it, depending on the level of nationalism to have a national identity. And so they use that as evidence to say, hey, why don't we have a national identity and unite under that? Why don't we unite with a nation? Why don't we, uh, you know, support them? And those are really our brothers. You know, what, you know, what, do, you, what do you think about uh, that in light, of, in light of your studies and now? Jazakallah khair, this is a very important point. This is why one has to keep one's feelings and emotions in check. Mm. Because sometimes feelings and emotions can lead you off the Islamic path into a terrain where you're just by yourself, your own opinions. Mm. Not that you're off Islam, I'm not saying that, but you're just doing things that are counterproductive to what you want to do. First of all, I would like to say, when you talk about these ideas, libertarianism, socialism, capitalism, Black nationalism, you need to define your terms. Define your terms. A basic term paper, your professor will give you a zero if in the introduction you haven't defined what do you mean by black nationalism. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. No. Because it is a contested concept. It's no. a concept that different people have different meanings. So, for example, libertarianism, if you look in America, those people who call themselves libertarian are not libertarians. Mm. They're not libertarians. Libertarians believe in liberty, freedom, movement. They believe in borders. Libertarians don't have borders. Capitalists mm. do. Mm. Libertarians allow people to believe in Islam and to believe in Christianity. Whatever you want to believe. Most of those people who call themselves libertarians in America don't believe in... They want to vanquish Islam for America. So there's a liberty in that. Mm. Mm. No. And so you have to be careful with some of these. Even when you say someone is a liberal economic liberalism is not like social liberalism mm. are you with me mm. so you have to clarify your terms so black nationalism is a large spectrum of people some people who you would say are black nationalists and some people you would never say are black nationalists but no. black nationalism as i understand it as defined by malcolm x in his speech uh, the ballot to the bullets and mission to the grassroots is mm. the allowing not allowing but Black people having the right of economic, social, and political independence in their communities. Mm. If that's what you mean. So, for example, I'm now in Harlem, mm. in the black side of Harlem. I mm. should be able to have people who represent me, who are like me, who are politicians, mm. in terms of the economics, mm. all these things. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. Mm. If you go to communities of Pakistani communities here, that's what they have. Mm. You go to Birmingham, member of parliament is Pakistani. Mm. Local businesses run by Pakistanis. Mm. Same with the Bengali community. Same with the Arab community. So I don't think anybody has a problem with that. If that's what you mean by a black nationalism. If black nationalism is something else, then you need to find it so we can find it. That's the first thing. Mm. Second thing, go back to my first point. Muslim countries are not the reference point. Mm. I hasn't said to you, follow what this ref this particular Muslim country says and does. Mm. Hasn't done that. Allah hasn't yeah, said to no. you, this particular sheikh, only what he says and does is your reference point. Mm. Because he's not masoom, he's not infallible. No. They, we don't claim that as in uh, Imam al-Tahawi, in his aqidah, infallibility is not for the Bashar. Mm. It's for the Anbiya wa Rusul. They, them, they, yes. Us, no. Mm. So us as humans, we may have our desires, we may have misunderstandings. We may have gaps of knowledge. We make fatwa or do actions based upon that, which may be correct or incorrect. Mm. So uh, using a country as a reference point is a big mistake because you don't find none of the ulama doing that. You don't find the alim saying, well, hey, 
We smoke shisha in our country because this is our culture. They mm. don't do it because it's not their culture. I mean, we'd mm. laugh at that. Sounds childish, doesn't it? Right, right. So yeah. you don't use the culture or a group of people or what they do based upon their particular circumstances. Because you may have a country, for example, Niger or Niger. I remember some years ago, there was a drought in Niger. Mm. There's no water, no food. So you know what the people did, brother? Mm. They made pies out of mud. They dug mm. the earth, what little wow. water they had, they made pies and they ate them. Wow. Also rats, they found rats, grilled them up and ate them. In that circumstance, there's no food. Their dorora, according to them and their scholars was, what can you do? You eat it, am I right? Mm, mm, mm. Is that our situation? No. Are you going to point to Niger and say, boy, but in Niger, they eat mud pie. We're going to eat mud pie. Sounds <laughs> immature, isn't it? Yeah. But that is the same logic that some of these people have. The reference point goes back to Quran and the Sunnah. Now here comes a problem. Unifying with the, the nation of Islam has many problems. Mm. So, for example, you say, we united with the nation of Islam. First of all, where's your Tawheed? Hmm. Tawun is upon Birri wa Taqwa. Oh, the now. greatest of beer of righteousness is Tawheed. Hmm. Where is the Tawheed? Hmm. The nation of Islam believe in incarnationism. They believe a man by the name of Fahd Muhammad came in 1934 in the person, Allah in the person, meaning he incarnated himself. No. Allah became a man. Came to Americans, the African Americans, sorry, in 1930, left in 1934. He is Allah. Now it doesn't get it gets deeper there. Fahd Muhammad's father, his name is Alfonso, he's an Allah. Hmm. He went up into the Caucasus Mountains. This is their creed, their aqidah. He hmm. went up into the Caucasus Mountains, hmm. found a white woman by the name of Baby G, hmm. had a baby with her, who wow. became Fahd Muhammad. They also believe that Fahd Muhammad is one Allah of a number of Allahs. Every 1,200 years, a new Allah comes with a new Quran. Wow. Unity with these people? Is that Islam? Is that Islam? Are you telling me that's Islam? Mm. Unify with them on Barwa Taqwa. But we haven't stopped there. Mm. Then they say Elijah Muhammad. Elijah Muhammad. He said he's a messenger after the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Elijah Muhammad said it in so-called Muhammad Speaks. I wouldn't give two cents for the God of the Sunni Muslims. And he said it again in a book called The Theology of Time. Mm. They call our God the spook God. Why no. spook? Because a spook is something you can't see. No. It's an apparition you can't see, you can't touch. Because to them, God is a man. Mm. God is something, oh, well, something you can smell, mm. you can touch. You can feel, you can mm. hug, yeah. you can kiss. Subhanallah. So when Farah Khan came back in 1979 from making Hajj, mm. quote unquote Hajj, yeah. what did he say? Yeah. He yeah, said, he said, listen to this. He said, mm. you go around that stone, meaning the Kaaba, mm -hmm. and you say God is in that stone. Look at that. Subhanallah. <laughs> you say world? God is in that stone, mm. and there's no problem with that. Mm. But when I go around this man and I say God is in this man, there's a problem with that. <laughs> this is what they believe. Mm. So Elijah Muhammad is a messenger of the Prophet. If this is the case, I say to, to any brother who says, well, hey, unify with the nation of Islam. Well, unify with the Qadianis and Ahmadis. They're better. At mm. least the Allah of the Ahmadis isn't like Fahd Muhammad who's incarnate. The only problem with the Ahmadis is they believe that Ghulam and Mirza Ahmad is a prophet of the Prophet Muhammad. Hmm. You get me? Now, if I said that to that person, they would say, oh, no, Ahmadis, Qadianis, we can't unify with them. So how can we, just because they are black, we unify with them? Hmm. It's like saying because a, a rapist or a murderer is black and he raped or murdered the white women, we give him a squeeze? Hmm. Forget that he is an evil crime he's done. We just hmm. give him a squeeze? Hmm. That's, that, that's evil, that statement there, isn't it? Mm, 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 mm. Absolutely. Evil Absolutely. So, so, so they say this. So, how can we have unity with those people who believe in a different religion, irrespective of what they call it? Mm. Even if they share the same symbols, they share the symbols: Islam, yeah. Muhammad, Prophethood, Salah. They share that with us, but they, the Akil is different. Same with the Rafida. No. Same with the Ismailia. Mm. Same with all these these esoteric groups and organizations. Even they call themselves Muslims. A thousand times. Where's it Islam? Yeah. And so okay. another problem arises. 
I hear a number of people talking about, well, Malcolm X was in the nation before he went to make Hajj. They need to take the history. Malcolm left the nation, and when he left, did he just leave it quietly? He denounced Elijah Muhammad. No. He said Elijah Muhammad was a, was a liar and a cheat who didn't believe in what he preached. And that's the reality. Oh, Neither Elijah Muhammad or his children believed in the doctrine. Mm. They just saw it as a good ruse to use to make money. Mm. The nation of Islam was a business. All those people talk about other businesses of the nation. They All those businesses were in the name of Elijah Muhammad and his children. Mm. They're the only ones who benefited and profited. Mm. Nobody else. And if somebody was able to open a little store, they were the exception, not the rule. There's dresses for the women mm. made by the daughter of Elijah Muhammad. Mm. The Salaam restaurants owned by Elijah and his children. They're the ones who benefited, not mm. the black community. Mm. Black community in general have never benefited from the nation. That's mm. why Malcolm X, he went on the, after the march on Washington. They said, you Muslims do a lot of talking. What are you going to do? Mm. When he did that march, if you remember, in New York against the Ronald Stokes, after yeah. he came back from, when he came, he came to the police station yeah. and he did that march. What was mm. he, they said to him, they said, you Muslims are good at talking. What are you going to do now? Mm. The nation of Islam were infamous for doing lots of talking, benefiting themselves, but never the black community at large. Mm. And that's the case until today. Mm. Muhammad, Muhammad uh, University, their school, largely the, 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 the ministers and the large Muhammad children went to that school. Not the, the rung and file Muslims mm. of, of the nation of Islam. No. So this is the reality. So Malcolm X denounced the, the, the Aqidah of Elijah Muhammad. And he exposed Elijah Muhammad as having eight girlfriends. Elijah Muhammad, in his own words, does not believe in polygyny. And no. this is why I fail to understand how those people who say they are his eight wives, mm. and many times they liken his eight wives to the wives of the Prophet, wasalam, no. which no. also no. shows you the deviancy. Mm. They say he had eight wives. Elijah Muhammad is against polygyny. Mm. So how can Elijah Muhammad have wives when he himself taught his people not to have more than one wife? Mm. Same as to shave the beard and shave the moustache, wear a suit. That's Elijah Muhammad. That's what Elijah Muhammad taught. So mm. now Elijah Muhammad had babies with eight of his young secretaries, young secretaries, mm. in their teens, many of them. Mm. So, so Malcolm X came out, exposed that to the world, supported them in court, and they turned their back on him years later. That's mm. a side issue. Mm. But he exposed that, and that meant he signed his own death warrant. Mm. Why did they kill Ma Malcolm X? Malcolm X was killed by the Nation of Islam because he was a heretic. Mm. They have well, in their yeah. newspaper his head yeah. bouncing. Yeah, yeah. He was Benedict Arnold. He was a heretic. Why? Because not only did he expose Elijah Muhammad to the rank and file Muslim who didn't know what Elijah was getting up to, but also he denounced his creed and he became Sunni Muslim. So he left his creed and then he went to Mecca. Note here, brother, Malcolm X had been to Mecca previously to arrange the Hajj of Elijah Muhammad. Mm. I think it was in the early 60s or the late 50s. He already been to Mecca and he really saw that people, white people were there. He knew white people were there. He knew there were different races in Mecca. It wasn't something he went to Mecca and then he found there were different races. He knew that already. Mm. So he left the nation and then he went to make Hajj became Sunni and came back and Rahmatullah was killed. And here comes a question. All those people who love Malcolm X, how can we unify with the people who killed him? Mm. Until today, they're unrepentant. Until your Farrakhan, go check it on YouTube. And if we treated Malcolm like a traitor and we killed him like a traitor, what does it have to do with you? Mm. Subhanallah. Yeah. <laughs> this is the nation of Islam. Mm -mm. This mm. is the nation of Islam. So how are you going to come to me and say you love Malcolm X and you want unified with these people who only cared about them and theirs, mm. meaning the Elijah Muhammad's family? Yeah. That's what it was all about. If and if you look at that film, look at that film, uh, the, the series, uh, Who Killed Malcolm X? Why mm. are the brothers so cover, you know, co coveting the, the name of Elijah Muhammad? Elijah Muhammad was a false prophet. Mm. One of the most despicable people, yeah. one of the worst people is that who claims to have prophecy when they don't have prophecy. Mm. Why are you well, defending yeah. Elijah Muhammad? Elijah mm. Muhammad, well, yeah, maybe to a degree he helped the black community, but he helped the black community in order to help himself. What did he do for the rank and file Muslim? You tell me. Mm. Besides the talk, what did he do? 
All he did was build upon what Marcus Garvey bore. What did he do for the rank and file? Did he open schools for them? Did he have breakfast programs like the, like the Black Panthers for them? What did he do for the rank and file black person? Nothing. Mm -hmm. All this is nostalgia. And unfortunately, sometimes nostalgia is just emotional feelings. And when you get wrapped up on your emotions, it can somehow and sometimes make you blurred about reality in front of you. And I think, you know, that, that basically what I want to say. Nation of Islam, one, are not Islamic. They have a creed which is antithetical to Islam. No. Two, Nation of Islam are not somebody who will, once in position of power, do something for the black community. Mm. Rather, they will do as much like the Khwani Muslim for them and theirs, for themselves. Mm. And three, it is not the objective. And a good example of the second point is, why is Farrakhan now, now messing around with Scientology? Mm. Why? Mm. So he's saying we're doing Scientology for the counseling to help uh, black people in trauma. There is no scientific evidence that the counseling and the methods of the Nation of Islam work. Mm. Scientology as a religion was based upon a dare. Ron L. Hubbard was dared. He was a fantastic science, science fiction writer. He wrote Scientology. There you have a, a, a their religion. The means of counseling and trauma is fake. If you really want to help black people, get counseling that's evidence-based like CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, not the Scientology. But why do they go to Scientology? Look, every person you bring to Scientology, you make money. They pay money for the counseling. It's not like uh, you get counseling with their apparatus and it's all free. No, mm. you pay money, you get a cut of that. So, for example, if it's ten dollars a person, if I bring ten people, how much do I get? Hundred dollars, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, a mm. hundred people, a thousand dollars. Imagine how many people Farrakhan has brought and how much money he's making. That's what it's all about. Mm. And he said, "I don't care." Of course, he doesn't care. He got money. He's about intergenerational wealth for him and his kids. His kids and his grandkids have intergenerational wealth now. Mm -mm. Mm. He's a multimillionaire. So are his sons and his daughters. They have wealth. Why would he care? Second point is it only about them and theirs? Mm. I hope that answers. I've been going on for quite a long time. Jazakallah <laughs> khairan. Allah you barak peek. So that, those uh, are really the issues, the main, uh, some of the main points, some of the main things we, we wanted to discuss. And Jazakallah khairan for your time. Allah you barak peek for sharing what you, you shared with us. And inshallah ta'ala. In the future, Allah, hopefully we'll have be able to have some other sittings. Be absolutely Allah. happy. Be absolutely. Jazakallah khair. Barakatuh. Hayak Allah. Salaamu alaykum. Rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaykum salam. Rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.